great day for you today, and I hope uh, all of you can stay right through to the end. Um, once again, we're going to hear from technical people, standards people. We're going to hear from a group of clinicians this morning. We're going to hear some more from patients. So once again, we're trying to bring all of these multiple stakeholder perspectives to bear and uh, let us look at the challenges we have from all the different angles, which uh, I think is very powerful. So this session is a, a bit of a long one, but fortunately you have lots of different speakers. So just think of it as a, a number of sequential presentations that when taken as a whole are going to, uh, I think, stimulate uh, even more conversation. Yesterday, uh, I hope most of you uh, were here for the keynote presentation by Trevor Hodge. You heard about the clinical interoperability strategy. And so the purpose of this session, uh, regardless of how much he built it up yesterday, was to further explore those five themes. So to refresh your memory, I thought I would give you just the pricey version of the five themes and the kinds of things that uh, fell out of those conversations. So the first one is about creating an environment where we can have clinicians lead these interoperability efforts. So we heard some great clinical leaders yesterday, and they are great examples. Dr. Glenn Geiger, Peter Rosos, talking about their interoperability efforts and the role of the clinician leaders who actually are the ones who made that happen. And so part of this strategy is how do we stimulate lots more of that clinician leadership driving the effort. We mentioned yesterday interoperability specifications. So member specifications or recipes, Trevor called them, regardless of the standards selected, adapted, used, we need something in the end that the developer can pick up, use, and implement. So we're going to explore that a little bit this morning. We need to modernize, use simple, open solutions that really make interoperability easy. So again, now we're into the technical tools, tools to map things, to document things, to share things. And so we're going to explore some new tools today. We talked about moving from project-based interoperability to services-based interoperability and the role of the Health Information Exchange services to drive that. And uh, we'll talk about that in the days to come also. And then we also talked about having all the stakeholders have a voice, our clinicians, our e-health programs, vendors, developers, implementers, and all others. And how do we make sure that they're all in the conversation so that we accelerate interoperability? So Trevor's keynote, he kind of teased you and promised you more details, and that's what we're going to try and do today. We have already started working on a number of those strategy elements, and so it really is our pleasure to begin share with you today the work that we have started, by no means finished, so be gentle. Um, we're going to start by sharing with you um, our plan to get more people engaged. So InfoWay and our value, we heard over and over again when we did our stakeholder engagements, InfoWay is valued because we provide a place where people can come together to work on common problems. And if accelerating interoperability is our problem, we need to provide spaces for many more people to get engaged. So that's the first thing we want to show you today. Um, you're going to get a chance to see a new platform we call InfoCentral Beta. You're going to be able to see its features for supporting many more online collaborative groups. You're going to see how it supports standards distribution, how we can provide a one-stop shop for all those interoperability tools that I just talked about, and all the materials that are produced in all the projects across the country. We're going to give you a sneak peek on a couple of prototypes. One, to support the process of documenting and publishing clinical requirements and another, a template for documenting and publishing interoperability specifications. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up. We're gonna have time for some questions. 
be gentle in discussions. A little bit of this stuff is work in progress, so please be understanding. So we have a sequence of presenters this morning. So rather than introduce them and interrupt our flow, I'm going to introduce them all to you right now. So from my left to my right, Sherry Dorkin, Maria Voltolina, Susan Seppa, Tanya Achilles, and Sam C. And these people have been working very hard. These are uh, a number of the leaders in our clinical interoperability group at InfoWay. And uh, I know that they're very excited to share with you the stuff that we have been heads down working on for the last few months. So this is where the rubber meets the road for us. We've spent about 18 months in discussions with all of you. We formed a strategy. It's all about achieving interoperability more quickly and less painfully. So we know for sure that the only way we accomplish this is if we continue to share and work together and share the efforts that are taking place across the country. So we had three goals for today. I'll share the goals with you and then I'll come back at the end and we'll have some conversations, see how we did. I'm hoping that as you listen to the presentations today, you'll consider some new ways of working together to address standards and interoperability priorities. That you'll explore with us the value of engaging with clinicians differently to improve how we accomplish interoperability. And lastly, identify some new ways to support the developers and implementers so that we can achieve our interoperability goals more easily. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, who's going to talk about people, because it's not about technology, it's about people. Thanks, Lynn. I really am excited to share the work that we've been doing to date with you. As Lynn said, it really is about the people. And we heard that ensuring the right stakeholders and the stakeholders have a voice is one of the key factors that's gonna to lead to the success of this strategy. So today we're gonna to further explore how our broad, sorry, thanks, how our broad stakeholder collaboration and communication is gonna actually provide a mechanism for that information sharing the coordination and collaboration working on different specifications and standards, as well as ultimately connecting to those on the ground projects and furthering clinical interoperability across the country will take place. Yesterday, you heard Trevor talk about the importance of collaboration and specifically discuss the Clinical Interoperability Steering Committee. This is a group of influential leaders that will provide advice on the clinical interoperability strategy and its implementation. This group, which is being chaired by Trevor Hodge and Dr. Peter Rosos, is made up of leaders, including CMIOs, vendors, uh, chief information officers, and other leaders across the industry and across the country. This group, which actually had its inaugural meeting yesterday right here at this conference, has the daunting but exciting job of furthering interoperability and helping shape what needs to be done. They'll work with people across the country and across different areas in order to get a sense on what work actually makes the most sense to focus on and prioritize. In fact, one of the very first deliverables of this group is the development of a three-year action plan to implement the National Strategy on Interoperability. <clears throat> Communities are a bit different. Communities provide an opportunity for people to collaborate and communicate on interoperability topics that are of interest to them, including their peers, and on an ongoing basis. They are the forums where you can share news, attend education sessions, come together and meet with your peers, and find both new and historical documentation that's really relevant to your needs. Communities are formed around different aspects of interoperability. They can be formed around specific priorities, such as sharing clinical documents or synoptic reports. They can be formed around specific areas or specific domains of interest, such as lab or digital imaging. They can be formed around standards like HL7 or CDA, and they can also be formed around certain professional groups. So for example, a group of nurses might come together to be interested in a, in a nursing interoperability challenge. 
These groups are opened, however, the membership of these groups may determine that there needs to be a, a closed membership. So for example, a group of nurses. People will really drive the need and the demand for these communities. Our intent is that they'll actually grow organically based on what really needs to be done and what information people would like to share. The very first communities that we will be launching include community around digital imaging, public health surveillance, and medication management. These communities are gonna further the momentum of a lot of the great work that's already been gone on in our standards collaborative working groups. As well, we'll be looking to launch a tooling community and a clinical requirements community to help further the dialogue in these areas. In this model, standards become more relevant. Uh, both pan-Canadian and international standards become more relevant to furthering clinical interoperability within Canada. They're going to be easier to find. Both they're going to be tied to the work going on in working groups as well as communities. And they're actually going to be more linked to furthering the needs of on-the-ground implementation projects. In terms of the standards world, both pan-Canadian and international standards, this is really the place where you can come and participate in the evolution of these standards, either through voting or balloting, through helping to influence what's going on, both within Canada and internationally, and really come play in all aspects of the standards world. InfoCentral, which we'll demo shortly, will showcase how InfoWay is going to continue to support, maintain, and sustain both pan-Canadian and international standards. The first standards communities that you will see launched include ISO, IHE, PCLOCD, which is our lab terminology standard, HL7, and SNOMED-CT. And I apologize to those who are not part of the Inside Baseball Language Standards community, in case there are any acronyms. Starting in December, we'll really be looking to you as well as your colleagues to help us propose the communities that you'll actually feel will make the biggest difference for this agenda. We're proposing a very simple process to setting up these communities. Via our Info, our Info Central beta, there'll be an application or a process to put forward a community, including a short description and some very brief criteria just to ensure that the community really line, aligns and furthers clinical interoperability in our country. Next month, you can expect more information, but in the meantime, if you have an idea for a community that you would like to launch, please feel free to speak to any one of us or drop us an email and you'll see our email address at the end of the presentation. Okay. Working groups. Working groups actually have a different role where communities are ongoing uh, and are based on needs as long as, as they're required and as long as they're an interest. Working groups, uh, clinical interoperability working groups, actually respond to the priorities put forward by the Clinical Interoperability Steering Committee. They're very focused on specific work or on specific deliverables. Uh, a working group can also be formed to support the needs of an actual community. So these are the groups that will work on the actual deliverables. They'll work on what the clinical requirements are. They'll work on what the specifications or the recipes actually are. And they will be the groups that help to develop the standards as well, as well as even potentially some technical solutions. These are really the groups where you can come and roll up your sleeves and really get the work done. They will be made up of committed implementers, engaged stakeholders, and they'll have broad representation. They'll be led by project sponsors, subject matter experts, or dedicated facilitators. Some of the examples of the first working groups that we're looking to launch include one around communicable diseases, synoptic reporting to support digital imaging, and potentially e-prescribe. The output of these groups will have a direct impact on the success of the on-the-ground projects, either immediately or at some point in the future. So imagine a working group dedicated to solving how to share communicable disease information across jurisdictions to help monitor potential outbreaks. This group would have a sponsor. In this case, it might be a provincial e-health program that's putting in place a public health surveillance solution. They would have lab specialists, they'd have epidemiologists, and they'd have vendors at the table, all working collaboratively to focus on what really needs to be done to further the work in this area. 
they would be able to work together to define what those deliverables are, and then they would be able to implement them in order to further the success of their projects. These materials would then be available through our InfoCentral beta for others who come after them to be able to implement them as is or potentially adapt them for the needs that they have. So the opportunity to sponsor a working group really begins right now. Um, we have the opportunity to work with our Clinical Interoperability Steering Committee and put in place that three-year plan to further interoperability in our country. Implementation projects. Throughout this journey, one of our key lessons learned is that the best work and the most success that we've had has been work that's been grounded in actual implementation projects. This is the place where you can actively, either at this point in time or potentially down the road when you're in that project mode, come to the table and actually help shape the deliverables that will meet your needs. You can adopt and adapt them for your own projects, and you can share and receive information from others across the country. InfoCentral Beta provides a way to effectively make this happen. Those connect, for those connected to these projects, you'll have the opportunity to work together, to share the load, and ultimately to have the tools that will make your implementations more successful. Some potential examples of projects that would benefit from something like this includes panorama implementations, foreign exam management projects, e-prescribing projects, or drug information system implementations. This is really your opportunity to be part of the collaboration, to learn and hear new voices, and to break down some of the past silos, and ultimately to identify the common solutions to some of the challenges that we currently face. That's it for me. I want to thank you very much for your time. I'm hoping that I've left you wanting more. And I'm now going to pass it over to Mario, who's going to tell you how the technology is actually going to support the collaboration. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I actually had planned to sing the portion of uh, the presentation, but as you know, the best laid schemes of mice and men. A uh, um, little bit about uh, the history of InfoCentral. Let me catch up. So InfoCentral was born out of the EMR and integration uh, program. It was a uh, repository, a wiki that was built to actually store information for the, uh, for the program, for specifications for EMR vendors to do their upgrades. Over the years, it has grown and grown and grown. It's now into the tens of thousands of pages and actually contains the distribution for the uh, pan-Canadian standards uh, for both messaging, for terminology. It includes specifications from Kaihai. It includes uh, some specifications from jurisdictional uh, parts. And uh, it's grown a little bit out of control. So, there's been all these discussions about collaboration, collaboration. We decided that the wiki probably wasn't the, uh, the optimal platform and solution. So we started thinking about it and uh, decided to still keep the wiki, but keep it as a small part of this new InfoCentral. And uh, this new InfoCentral really is intended to be uh, a destination on the internet for all of you to actually come perform all these collaborations, pieces of work that you've been hearing about over the past couple of days. It is the place to come and get news about the industry and what everybody is doing. It is the place to come and actually share ideas, collaborate, work together, to access resources that um, help actually the delivery of the solutions as well as the design of the solutions, to get news on events, um, what's happening, uh, by which group. Right now, it's very scattered. People have to go all over the place to actually find out what's happening in, in the industry, particularly in the space of interoperability. So we want to bring it all together. And there's a huge amount of resources out there for training that would be really, really useful for uh, people to access and share. And so, again, InfoCentral uh, is going to be the destination. 
Couple of other pieces that we think are key to it is actually web and video conferencing. One of the things I personally hate is being on the end of a teleconference and never knowing whether anybody is still listening at the other end. You know, for most of the time they've probably gotten up, going to make some tea, get some food, and you wouldn't know it. Um, we just think that the video part really brings people together and uh, makes them uh, work more collaboratively. And uh, another important part is to connect uh, people's um, views. So the capability to do surveys, polls, voting is an integral part of the uh, of InfoCentral and the collaboration pieces. <coughs> but I don't want to give you the impression that it's just a you know a fancy email system that we've uh, stitched together. As I mentioned, the wiki is still part uh, of it, but it's actually a platform made up of you know one to two dozens different applications, including um, issue management, uh, requests for changes to the standards and tracking of that, the, uh, the new requirements collection and specification publishing uh, capabilities or applications, message remixer, which is a, an application for uh, actually <coughs> constraining and maintaining the uh, HL7 version three standards, um, APIs, not just the ones provided by or created by um, InfoWay, but also the ones, for example, Peter Rosso's mentioned Happy yesterday from UHN, uh, both the uh, V2 and the FIRE part, we want to promote and support those. And so InfoCentral really is the place <coughs> to come and uh, find out all the pieces that would be useful to, uh, uh, to put together. Terminology tools, um, as was mentioned yesterday, terminology and data are really key. The emphasis is going to be more on getting that data right and getting that codification right as well. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, those are the, uh, so a whole bunch of different tools. You've been hearing a lot of hype about this today, so you're probably going, when do I get my demo? Well, I don't know, Lynn and Sherry <coughs> talked about the demo, but nobody talked to me about it, so we're not quite ready. Um, but we're going to be really ready soon. And in fact, today you are going to see a, a bit of a demo, and the rest of the team is going to walk you through some of, the, uh, some of the capabilities. But the other thing is that we're going to open it up for a limited release actually over the next few weeks in December. There are currently 3,000 people with accounts on InfoCentral, and immediately those uh, accounts will be active and allow people to log into InfoCentral. People will also be able to, uh, to register. So I'm really hoping to see you on InfoCentral uh, soon. Uh, today you'll get to see some of the capabilities and to be honest, it'll never be finished. It's a web platform. We want to keep improving it and we want to keep making it better and better based on your feedback as well. So we're really, really interested in you dropping us a line and there's great facilities on, on the site for you to you know, post suggestions, make requests and so on. And that's really what is gonna drive us going forward. So I'm now gonna pass it on to Sherry, sorry Sherry, to Sue, <laughs> who's gonna uh, tell you all about clinical requirements. So thank you. I'm uh, really, thank you, Mario. I'm really delighted to be um, talking to you this morning about clinical requirements. As Lynn said, uh, we've started some new work in this space. It's not finished. I'm really very excited to start to share with you some of this new work, and we will be looking for your participation in helping us evolve and develop this work. Um, clinical requirements are very important to me. Uh, in my career, first as a nurse, then as a consultant, and then as an IT leader, this, uh, I have personally witnessed the challenges that we have in this space of clinical requirements. We, we always engage our clinicians. Um, we always ask them what they want and what they need when we're going to develop systems and solutions. And yet, somehow, here we are with an alarming number of system implementations that drive our clinicians crazy and don't deliver what they need. So something hasn't, something hasn't worked and we're exploring a space that we're hoping is going to make a difference to adoption and use of our, of our solutions that we deliver. So first, just a quick definition about clinical requirements, how we're using it. Um, we define clinical requirements as First of all, the clinician's voice, 
describing their needs for information in a specific clinical context. And I want to thank uh, Peter Rossos for his, um, it's, the slide's a little bit different, but he used our slide yesterday as well and really validated that from a clinician's perspective when they talk about interoperability, to them, it's firstly a user experience. Um, so clinicians, you know, view interoperability not only about, not only as a, a user experience, but also about the content <coughs> and minimal disruption to workflow. So what does a clinician want? They want content they can use. They want uh, data that supports their workflow. They want data they can interact with, data they can graph, data they can collate, data that's meaningful to the patient that's sitting in front of them right now. Um, I, was, I thought it was also interesting yesterday, Glenn Geiger had a slide, I don't know if many of you saw that yesterday, where he had the slide of the clinician with all the bubbles around it, which reflected the cognitive workload of a clinician. And, you know, that really spoke to me. We don't understand often when we're gathering clinical requirements how much cognitive workload is actually going on. And that's where that whole human factors piece comes into our requirements approaches, is being sensitive to that. And those are, those are things that are very difficult to capture when we're doing our clinical requirements. So bottom line, clinicians need solutions that make things easier. Clinical care is already very complex, and it's very, very data rich. So in summary, the challenges for a clinician when you're talking about interoperability and you're talking about usable solutions is we, we give them a less than optimal user experience. We give minimal content at this point in time in, at the point of service or there just is minimal content even though there's lots of data out there and available and uh, workflow tends to be disrupted. So this is the, this is the new work. How we are proposing approach around deriving clinical requirements. We've engaged a number of stakeholders, had a number of conversations with many of you in the audience actually and others. Um, over the summer and fall, um, conducted a fairly extensive lit review, and we're proposing an approach on, on how to derive clinical requirements. We've, we've come to understand that there's often a mismatch between what clinicians say they want and need, and then what gets translated into business requirements and system requirements. I'm seeing lots of head nodding actually in the back of the room there, this is great. <laughs> um, so in many cases, uh, what has happened, of course, is that clinicians' needs are getting lost in that translation. And in other cases, it's the analysts, you know, all good intentions and good, great people and very good at their jobs, but again, not truly understanding that clinical context, not truly understanding all of those other components that go on around the cognitive workload. And so those things are not captured when we, when we define our, our solutions. So we've proposed an approach for how to um, derive clinical requirements. And it starts like this, if the slide is working. Where do I point? There we go. Uh, and it was interesting, actually, when we went out and had our conversations, we asked people, have you documented how you do clinical requirements? And people can talk to it, but we really couldn't find an approach to find, so we've taken a stab at it. So first you start with, of course, defining your scope. Like any, like any kind of project, you've got to define your scope. Where are we working in? What kind of situation are we working in? Is this an EMR uh, and a physician office? Is it an emergency room? What's the clinical context, right? What also is the system context? What systems are going to exchange information? Um, that's important to understand as a starting point before diving into the needs around the information that's required in that setting. So who's using the system? What systems are currently in place? What, what are the functions of the current systems? Uh, is there capability in those systems that we can leverage? And then the next area is this area we're calling the clinician's expression of need. 
It's guided by a set of clinical interoperability principle statements, and I'm going to show you these in just a moment, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. So, it, and, and they emerged, again, from our conversations with clinicians over the summer and, uh, and our literature review. So guided by these principle statements, we ask a set of questions and we observe uh, workflow and understand what's going on and try to capture some of that cognitive and other components of workload and workflow uh, that need to be considered. Uh, very influenced by conversations we've had with uh, the human factors folks over at UHN and uh, again other conversations in literature that's emphasized for, uh, in clinical and healthcare system design the importance of mock-ups early and often and lots of examples. The first thing that um, when we talk to some clinicians, they say the very first thing we do, even before you ask us what we need and want, is you have to show us something and let us react to that. And so in some cases, it's going where people have implemented this. In other cases, it's you actually have to draw something up. And they can react to that because it's very hard to express in words many times exactly what it is you're, trying, you're saying you need. So this is an approach, of course, that's very iterative. You're showing things, you're going back and, and making sure you've expressed the needs. And you're carrying through that and documenting, finally, a set of clinical requirements. Um, now, we did, did we show this slide earlier? I, I don't know that we did. Um, so this, these clinical requirements are within the context of, again, our architectural context. You would have seen this yesterday in Trevor's um, presentation. Um, I've shaded out the, some of the areas right now, but in, I just want to make the connection that clinical requirements don't just stand alone. They actually, they get gathered in context, both clinical context and system context, and then they contribute to the solution design. So uh, this is an eye chart, and it's not intended really for you to read it. We will be sharing uh, this information, and you'll actually see more of this in a moment when uh, we walk through the demonstration of our um, tool that we've created to derive clinical requirements. But I just want to show you these clinical interoperability principles. Um, and they're really, they're a set of 13 principles. It's an important component of this uh, proposed approach um, that we've described where we use these principles to guide a line of inquiry and observation about clinical needs. Uh, we believe they serve as a, like a reference checklist. They make sure that you don't forget to think about certain things when you're um, conducting your needs analysis or your clinician expression of needs. Um, you'll see they're grouped in the two areas, information needs and workflow needs. Um, and um, we've, we w are really looking forward to actually testing and evolving these with, with our clinical groups and stakeholders moving forward. Um, the questions asked, of course, are going to change with the situation or the clinical context. But we believe that the principles probably don't change, that it, they're going to continue a sort of as a static checklist. Now, they may not, you may not have to uh, ask the questions underneath each of those principle statements, but um, it, it's, it's a really good sor source of reference. So, for example, if I need to perform medication reconciliation, um, you may be able to see this, but I'll read it for you. Uh, I might apply principle six in the information category, which says, I need available clinical data to be aggregated and assembled to support care delivery. So the questions then that I might ask in that situation are, what medication information do I need? So drug name, strength, dosage, you're going to drive down and get that level of detail of information. What are the sources for this information? Where, where are you thinking you're getting it or where are you getting it today? Where do I need to see it? How do I need to see it? When do I need to see it? How does it need to be aggregated um, and assembled to support my workflow, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to ask a set of questions around that. 
The next step related to the development of these principles, as I mentioned, again, this is early work, includes validating and testing this approach further in some clinical requirements working groups, which we're hoping um, to get started as soon as possible. Uh, we're actively seeking and looking for volunteers that want to work with us in this space. So better clinical requirements. We know that successful adoption and of our information technology solutions is directly related to how clinicians are engaged. That is a theme that came through strong and clear. And I think we all know that. We actually all know that. That's why we always engage our clinicians. Interoperability and usability are closely linked concepts. Um, that was validated by the literature. It, it, it bears repeating. Interoperability and usability are closely linked. So it follows that if we do a better job engaging our clinical groups and reflecting their voice and requirements, we'll build solutions that get used. So by engaging differently and applying an iterative process, a set of clinical requirements is defined that inform the next phase in our solution design. This will result in um, some published collateral, we're hoping, uh, a set of requirements that, can, that will be available on our Info Central site that can be shared, uh, that might then, that, again, reusable, maybe start off a next similar engagement with something to begin with rather than starting from scratch. And as we mentioned, it'd be an input into the solution design phase. So, um, the, uh, oops, and so what I'm going to do now, uh, before I hand over, I think I'll just back up. Can I back up? Just on the wrong slide here. So I'm, we're going to hand over to Tanya now, who's going to um, walk you through a demonstration of this tool for clinical requirements uh, and uh, show you how, what we've built to date. And so I'm going to hand over to Tanya. Tanya? Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. For those of you who don't know me, um, I've worked both as a community pharmacist, so I've lived through filling hundreds of prescriptions a day, understand the importance of workflow and the challenges that disruption to workflow can bring. Um, I've also managed <coughs> e-health projects for a national pharmacy vendor, so I understand the challenges of implementing HL7v3 and ramping up a team of business analysts and developers to do that work. And so I think both of those, those experiences have really given me compassion for some of the challenges that clinicians and vendors have experienced in this space. And that's why I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about the work that we're doing and the work that we're hoping you'll engage in over the coming months. So you've heard from uh, the, the team in front of me um, some information about people and how we want to engage people and communities and working groups and implementation projects in this, in this new work. Um, you've heard about Info Central, um, new development that we've done to help those people collaborate together. And you've heard about clinical requirements and some of the work we've done around clinical requirements. And so I'm now going to sort of bring it down a level and I'm going to walk you through Info Central and how um, communities will work together on that tool, how they'll form working groups, and what a set of, set of clinical requirements could look like. And then I'll pass it over to Sam to show you specifications as well. So we're going to get more into the details here. So just imagine for a minute I'm a clinician or a vendor, I'm someone and I've logged into this new Info Central platform. And you'll see here that I've landed on a dashboard that really tells me about things that I'm interested in. So first of all, I can see all of the groups, whether they be working groups, implementation projects, or communities that are available to join on Info Central. So I can scroll down there and you can see there, you know, we've set up lots of test data, lots of groups. Um, I can also see the groups that 
that I personally have already joined and go in and see more information about what's happening in those groups. So in this example, I've joined a group related to diagnostic imaging and a working group related to foreign exam management. Um, I can see latest activity um, related to the groups that I'm interested in and I can also see upcoming events, so things I might want to engage in going forward and some recent news. Um, the menu is, is divided into two different sections, one around collaboration and one around resources. So under collaboration as well, you can see a separation of <coughs> which working groups are available, what communities and what projects. And you can go in and I'll, and I'll walk you through going in and joining a group and seeing the information that's available there. Um, as well, you can see resources. Those are things like um, events, technical solutions that are available, tools and other technical solutions that are available for you to use, um, standards, education information, surveys, and other, other resources. So I'm going to take you into the standards page for a moment so you can see um, some information <coughs> about how you can access standards. They'll also be available in the community, so if you have a community around medication management, you'd be able to also find within that community what are the standards that are related to medication management. Um, but we do have here the standards that InfoWay supports, how to access those standards, how to request a, ch request a change to the standards, and how to join a community that's talking about those standards so you can get engaged in that work. Um, as well, here on, on the side, you can see all of the standards communities that have been set up that you may want to join. So, the example that we're going to walk you through now is around medication management, around best possible medication history really because we thought that was something that a lot of different clinician groups, whether it be physicians or pharmacists or nurses, um, would be interested in. And we thought it was a good example that most people could really understand as well. So I'm going to now bring up a medication management community. And uh, you would have the ability on the, on the menu here to join that community. And you can see information about the community. So I can see each of our communities will have leaders. Those are really people who are just going to help drive the agenda, drive the conversation. So I would be able to see the leaders that are um, leaders for this particular community. I could also see key resources. Um, they could be things like, in a medication management community, a medication reconciliation toolkit that's available for you to use. Um, you know, pan-Canadian drug standards. It could be links to um, websites that we think would be of interest like, or that the community thinks would be of interest like, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices website. So if I go back to the medication management community, the first button I was looking for was the button to join the group. So if you look on the menu on the right hand side, you can see that you can join, join the community, join the working groups that you're interested in. Um, so I talked about the about tab already, but I can also see events that would be of interest to the medication management community. And they may be events um, that are, you know, happening external to InfoWay, like a webinar that the Institute for Safe Medication Practices is giving on medication reconciliation. They may also be events that where the community wants to get together and have conversations about what's of interest to, to them. And anyone within that community can create events and, and uh, engage others in the community in conversation. As well, there is a forum capability. So for a medication management community, you may have forum topics around things like medication reconciliation, e-prescribing, and other, other topics of interest. Um, you can post documents, so work on documents, maybe minutes for meetings, but also other documents that that group could be working on together. And you'd have the ability to post videos. So in this example, I've got a video from Mount Sinai Hospital about their medication reconciliation process that's been posted on YouTube. Um, there's also video conferencing capabilities that will be built in. 
So the community may, ha may hold a video conference and want to post that video conference for others within the community to see. And you can see uh, who, who are mem what people are members of that community and invite other people to become members of the community as well. So once I've joined the medication management community, there may be conversations going on in the forums and people will start to see connections, you know, related to work that people are doing in one province or one project that connect very well with work that's going on in other areas in the country. And that community may decide that it makes a lot of sense for us to, to create a working group and to work on a particular problem or particular opportunity. And so in this example, you can see that um, there's a conversation going on in this community about best possible medication history. And best possible medication history is, it's a clinical process. It's a process where clinicians gather all the information that they can about what a, pa what a patient is taking, is what medications a patient is currently taking. And they may gather that information from interoperable solutions, but they may also gather that information from patients or family members. So it's really a clinical process, but that clinical process can be supported by interoperability. So that group may say, we want to get together, we want to create clinical requirements and a specification to help support um, gathering a best possible medication history. And so they would be able to form a working group. And if I go back here, we can see that there is a best possible medication history working group. And unlike communities, the working groups are really driven around having particular deliverables. So if I scroll down here in the best possible medication history working group, you can see that there are very specific sponsors. So could be sponsored by Victoria General Hospital, um, could be sponsored by other hospitals across the country. Um, they would have leaders and those leaders would be committed to driving the deliverables forward. Um, they may have things that are open for review, so um, pieces of work that they're looking for stakeholders to provide feedback on. So in this example, they have draft clinical requirements that they're looking for stakeholders to provide feedback on. And they would have a set of final deliverables. So in this example, they're looking to create clinical requirements, a technical specification, and an API in order to support collecting a best possible medication history. Um, the capabilities for working groups, for communities, and for implementation projects that are working on InfoCentral are the same. They have the same, you know, events and forums and, and other things. But there are certain aspects that will be more relevant depending on what, what type of group you've created. So an example here is there is a task. Um, tab that allows you to set up milestones, identify who's responsible for delivering on those milestones, and be able to create a Gantt chart, really understand the schedule and the deliverables for that work. They would also have things like events, um, you know, could be events to work on particular pieces like clinical requirements, but could also be events to have people come and demo their solutions to give that group more information about what others have done in this area. Um, they would have forums as well to have their conversations and be able to capture video uh, web conferences and do other things that all of those groups can do. So in this example, this working group is starting off by creating a set of clinical requirements. And clinical requirements are really about a group of clinicians collaborating together to express their needs, supported by people from e-health programs, supported by vendors, and supported by other people who have information that can help, make, help them make the right decisions. And so in the case of a best possible medication history, clinicians may need to understand from people in e-health programs, what information is available to them in a DIS, what format is that information in. They may need to understand from their vendors um, how workflow decisions that they think they want to make will impact the workflow within their clinical systems. And so it's, not, it's about clinicians expressing their needs, but it's really about a group of, a larger group of stakeholders working together to help them clinicians in that process. 
So what we're going to show you now is an example set of clinical requirements. Um, we are working on changes within InfoCentral to allow working groups and implementation projects to both author and publish clinical requirements and specifications within InfoCentral. And we'll be looking to you to help us test that approach and provide feedback on that. So if I launch here now, what we've created so far is an example set of clinical requirements and we're working on the tool in order to support that. So I'm going to walk you through this example set of clinical requirements. So as Sue talked about, you know, one of the first steps that group of clinicians will want to do is um, define what is the scope of this set of clinical requirements. And that's understanding both, you know, what's in scope and what's out of scope to help guide the discussion, but also what systems are we using? Is this a hospital system connecting to a drug information system? And really sort of clearly set the parameters for the conversations going forward. They'll want to agree on key definitions. What is a best possible medication history? You know, is there an official definition out there? Can I, is everybody on the same page? If you're collecting a best possible medication history, it may be in support of medication reconciliation. So again, you'd want to have a definition of what medication reconciliation is so that everyone's agreeing to those definitions. And then that group of clinicians would start on, would start to work on expressing what their needs are. And Sue talked a little bit about a set of principles that have been created um, working with clinicians to really help to guide conversation, help to, to guide discussion around uh, what it is that clinicians need. And I'll give you an example of a few of those principles and what kinds of questions and what kinds of discussion um, we anticipate they would lead to. So a principle could be, I need to receive and send notifications about my patients and their transitions of care. Um, and that could lead to conversation around what notifications do I need to send, what notifications do I need to receive, and how do I send and receive those notifications. Um, another principle that we have is I need to know that the data is trustworthy and secure and who is it from. So that may lead you to a conversation around privacy and security, around, um, you know, what does it mean, what is trustworthy, what is the authoritative source for this information. Um, we have a, a principle that says I need clinically relevant information about my patient. So what's clinically relevant in this particular context? Um, what information do I need and in what format? And then we have workflow principles as well. So I need information access to be easy, intuitive, supporting my workflow with minimal steps and clicks. So that leads you into the conversation around what is your current workflow? Uh, the clinicians would discuss their current workflow, at what point in their workflow do they need to share and receive information, and how will that impact their workflow. Um, as well, they could have a conversation around the principle, I need to know that the system supports my clinical guidelines, standards of practice, and regulatory requirements. So again, delving more into what are the standards of practice, what are the regulatory requirements, and how can decisions that we make, that the clinicians make around their clinical requirements, support those. And at each of those steps, um, what we heard from organizations who, who do a really good job of engaging their clinicians is that it's not sufficient just to have conversations around what clinicians need, that they get the best input from their clinicians when clinicians can really see, really live and understand what a system is going to be like. And so we would want to reach out to um, stakeholders who have gone before, who have implemented similar systems and get demos and understand lessons learned and have those clinicians at the table to talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked to really get more of a sense of what, you know, what are the different options and what are the decision, what are the decision points here. As well, um, that, that working group could create mock-ups, again, as a, as a way to stimulate more conversation and to really allow clinicians to understand what, what it is that they could be getting out of a, a solution. And it's not intended, and we'll talk about this a little more when we show you the specification, 
Mockup is not intended to say, this is the way your software vendor must develop their system, this is you know, what it should look like, but really to help drive conversation, to help gather more clinical requirements, and to help guide what it is that clinicians need. So out of this, out of that needs analysis, um, you know, each of those steps, you would start to identify things that clinicians need. So the end result is a set of clinical requirements um, written in clinician language, expressing their needs for what, what they need from the solution. Um, clinical requirements are then used for, as a basis for solution design and also get translated into business rules within a specification that business analysts and developers will understand. And the idea is that within that working group, clinicians, vendors, e-health program people will be working together both on the clinical requirements and on the specifications. And so as the specification starts to be developed, there will be there will be times that they'll need to go back to the clinicians and ask questions and get clarification and it's really a collaborative um, effort to develop these. Um, as projects are implemented, lessons learned will be reflected back into the clinical requirements and I think this is a big benefit because right now we don't really have a good mechanism for sharing those lessons learned nationally. We do it in, we do it in working group meetings, we do it in presentations but not really for doing a, a, an analysis of why things worked and why they didn't and capturing them in a central place that people can come to to learn about um, those projects. So the end result will be clinical requirements and specifications that will be published and can be used as a starting point for other projects that come after. <coughs> so I'm now going to hand over to Sam who will show you how these clinical requirements get translated into an implementable specification and ultimately into a system that clinicians can easily use. Thank you. Thank you, Tania. So, so carrying with the previous example, you have heard that a working group gather and created the clinical requirement. And now, the very same working group will start creating a specifications for implementers. However, creating and implementing a specification in eHelp has not been easy. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of expertise. And one of the group that really feel the pain is the developer. And currently, they face numerous challenges when implementing a spec. First of all, there's a lot of content. It's not uncommon for some of these specifications to be over a thousand pages long when you include all the content. And not all the content are relevant to everyone. Also, specifications look very different across Canada, which make it a new learning curve every time a developer implements a new spec. It's also very complex. There are multiple requirements from multiple stakeholders. The workflow tend to be very complex. On the technical side, there are messages, data type, vocabulary, all need to be fully understood by the developer to implement the spec. With all this content and complexity, a lot of the time the developer don't even know how and where to get started. They, they simply feel overwhelmed. So at InfoWay, we want to find a way to create better specification by providing an offering and publishing solution that could help the developer to implement the specification in a much more efficient manner. And also for specification writer as well, because they are the one that need to write and maintain the content in the spec. When writing a specification, it is also very important to consider the architecture, which provide guidance on how to incorporate the clinical requirement into the spec from both business and technical perspective. Also, it's equally important to be aware of the constraint in the solution being built. For example, at the bottom of the diagram, you know that there is EHR, which could be a DIS system. 
And let's assume that the IS system is a legacy system. And one of the constraints is that it needs to be compliant with the older standard, which uses a sp specific set of messages and vocabulary. Beyond that, there could be other constraints like time, cost, hardware, and software limitations. All these constraints need to be identified and considered when writing the specification so that the published specifications is implementable by developer and at the same time providing what clinician need. At this point, I will provide you a demo of a sample specification that we created to illustrate what a good specification look like. And I will show you how it can be accessed through InfoCentro. So once I'm in InfoCentro, what I will do is select the same working group that is working on that specification. And in this case, it will be the best possible medication history working group. And as Tanya as de demonstrated earlier, this is the working area where the working group create both the clinical requirement and specification. And once the specification is created, it can be accessed by clicking on the specification button. Another thing I want to point out is that there's also a solution tab, which implementer may find useful. It provides open technical solutions like API, terminology tools, and others. Now, without further delay, let me show you the sample specification that I've been talking about. So when we were designing this sample specification, not only that we look at specifications that have been created in eHealth, but also other open source projects which are very developer focused and apply some of those best principles best principle into the sample spec. As you can see on the left-hand side here, the spec is broken down into five major sections. The very first one is getting started, which is shown on the right-hand side here. It provides a few simple steps to help the reader to get started based on their role. So for example, as a developer, it will give me access to content like API, sample code, sample messages, and other technical content. On the other hand, as a business analyst, it will give me access to business content like use cases, business rules, hints, and others. The intent is to customize the experience and show relevant information based on who you are and what you do. Next, I will go to the overview and mock-up section. Starting off with the overview, and then under that, we will provide a mock-up, which shows you how the end solution may look like. And within the mock-up, it will also show you mapping to the business rule. By putting a mouse over these BR label, it will show you a detail about a particular business rule that is correspond to. So in this case, according to business rule number 20, it's saying that the patient's name, birthday, and gender must be displayed. It's a mandatory business rule. And these are the messages that contain these informations. These labels are also color-coded as well. So green is a mandatory business rule, yellow is suggested, and blue is a hint. Beside that, we also want to show the workflow as well. For example, perhaps the user must sign in before they can see the medication profile screen. Now, in reality, the, the workflow will be a lot more complicated, there will be a lot more screen, but the intent is sh to show all of that in this mockup. And even though you ha we haven't gone through the whole specification, you already have a general understanding of what the end solution could offer. And then next, in the business interoperability section, this is where we provide business content. And starting off with the use cases, by clicking on it, it will show me all the details. And these use cases get created from the clinical requirement, and they serve two purposes. Number one is to break down a large specification into smaller pieces of work. And second, to serve as a bridge from the business need to the technical design and standard. And under that, you will also find all the business rules that get used in all the different use cases. Each of these business rules are uniquely identified by an ID, 
and this allows traceability so that you can reference a business rule in other pages or documents. They are also sortable by clicking on the header. So if I click on it, I can find out all the mandatory business rule. Click it again, you find all the suggested. And at any point in time, you can also do a quick search to find what you need. There is also a hint section which has a very similar format like the business rule, except with a slightly different ID, HI standing for hint. And then next, in the information interoperability sections, this is where you can find all the clinical relevant data element. In other words, what information does the clinician need and what information they need to provide. And starting off with the interaction diagram, this shows the exchange of information from one system to another. So for example, in order to get the medication profile, I must the user must identify the patient and then the application will send the get medication request message to the drug information system. It will return a response, get process, and then display the information back to the user. Under that, you will also find out what standard is supported for this particular specification. And in this case, it's HL7 V3 Xerox 4.3. And potentially, it could be other standard as well such as HL7 V2, CDA, FIRE. And then under that, it will, it will also list out all the messages that are required to implement for this bag and data element as well. So for example, to get the medication profile summary, the clinician need to provide these information, such as the patient's health ID, the patient's name, and other information. And then in return, these are the information that we will provide back to the clinician, such as drug name, medic, uh, the drug status, the prescriber name, and other information. And also on the left hand side, you can find out which business rule it is mapped to for each of the data element. And once again, you can put your mouse over these uh, business rule label and find out the detail. As a developer, I will probably want to learn more about a particular data element. <coughs> And traditionally, this hasn't been easy. In fact, a developer has once told us that he needs to go through 74 documents to implement one message. Let me say again, 74 documents. <laughs> and to be fair, some of these documents were published by Infoway. <laughs> there we go. And inside that zip file, there are more zip files. And guess what? Inside each of these zip files, there are more files. <laughs> So as a developer, not only I need to find out which file I need, but I also need to connect the information myself afterward, because all of these files are interconnected in some way. So there got to be a better way of doing this. So since last year, we developed a new product called HL7 Explorer, which consolidates these information into one common place, which can be easily accessed online, search, and navigate. To demonstrate that, let me go back to the spec. And let's say I want to learn more about this particular data element, patient gender. I will click on that, and that will bring me to HL7 Explorer and give me all the detail that I need to know. This includes the definitions and other type of documentations, as well as data type, value set, and many other information. Some of these information are hyperlinked, so you can click on them and learn more about them. Going back to spec, same thing for vocabulary, if I click on it, it will bring me to HL7 Explorer and show me all the vocabulary. So in this case, F stands for female, M stands for male, and if I click on any one of these concepts, it will give me detail on the right-hand side here. And at any, any point in time, let's say I want to look up something else, I can simply click the search button and select what I want to search for, let's say data type, and let's say I want to look up uh, the Boolean data type. Again, I click on that, and I can find out more information about it, all in one place. So going back to the spec, now that I know what information I need to implement, I can go to the technical section and find out how to implement them. 
So in here, this is where I can find technical components like API, sample code, sample messages, and other technical content. Starting off with the API, what is an API? So let me. So you can think of the API as a development tool really intended for developer to use to easily create and read healthcare messages. In other words, it really minimizes the learning curve to implement a healthcare standard such as HL7, V3, V2, CDA, FHIR. So InfoWay developed a product called Message Builder, which supports HL7, V3, and CDA. Also, for HL7, V2, and FHIR, there's another API called Happy, created by University Health Network. The intent is to, instead of having the developer to create their own API, which is a very time-consuming process, there will be an API that they can readily pick up and easily integrate into their product. So going back to the spec, right here we'll tell you exactly which API to use, how to set it up, where to download it, as well as with some additional resources in learning how to use it, such as demonstration video, user guide, and possibly some courses as well. Under that, you can also find sample code that have been created specifically for this bag. So here is a sample code for creating the medication profile summary request message. And then here is a sample code for processing the medication profile response message. And within the sample code, they are also mapping, again, uh, to the business rules. So for example, again, according to business rule number 20, the patient's name, birthday, and gender must be uh, required. And then here are the sample code for getting those information. In fact, even if you're not a developer, if you kind of read the, the code, you get a good, uh, a good understanding of what you're getting. So here I'm getting the patient's name, the patient's birthday, and the patient's gender code. And to show you how useful the sample code is, we created a demo application that implements this bag. And it looks something like this. There are two things that I want to point out in this demo app. Number one is that you will notice the look and feel is very different from the mockup. And that is done on purpose because a lot of developers ask us, do they need to create their product to look exactly like the mockup? And their answer is no. It's really intended to give you a better understanding of the content in the spec. And as a developer, you still have a lot of freedom in designing the, uh, your product. And it can be different depending on what a device is running on. For example, this demo application is tablet friend, uh, friendly. It can run on mobile as well. So that, so that is why the interface is very simple. The buttons are very large. Now to carry on with the demo, let me select the patient. And here I will see the patient's profile information. And in a separate tab, I can click on the medication and find out the list of medications. And just like the, just like the markup, it provides all the information that the clinician needs as defined in the specifications, except one, which is the dosage instruction. And now I will use this uh, specification to show you how I can implement this missing data element. So I will go back to the spec. I will go to the information page and find out which business rule contain the dosage instructions. So it's business rule number 13. So now I will go back to the technical page and find out how to implement it based on the sample code. And I will look for business rule number 13. Copy the code. And then, so here's the code for my demo application. I will replace this line with the correct code. Save it, give it a few seconds to update. And another thing I want to point out is that this demo application is already using the API. So now I will go back to the demo applications. 
So if everything works correctly, once I hit the refresh button, the dosage instruction should get populated. So let's find out. Ah, so just like I expected, it works. <laughs> so as you can see, by providing <coughs> both the API and the sample code, it does make it a lot easier for the developer. And besides sample code, there are also sample messages which developer have indicated they are very useful. And also there are other technical content like security, authentication, transport, and others. So at this point, you have seen how the specification make it easier for the developer. But beyond that, we also want to make it easier for people who are writing the content for both the specification and clinical requirements. So at InfoWay, we are also providing an offering and publishing solution for both the clinical requirement and specification. In the first release, it will include a number of key features. We'll keep it very simple to use, leveraging modern web technology to provide a positive user experience. It will also support versioning, because for both clinical requirement and specification, it will go through multiple versions in their lifetime. It will also support granular permission support so that you can define exactly who gets to read and write each of these documents. And last but not least, it will also allow you to export these documents either into Microsoft Word or PDF file. So collectively, we want to make this so that specification is e to, easier to write, easier to implement, and ultimately creating solutions that provide what clinicians need more quickly and effectively. At this point, I will pass it back to Lynn to wrap up this presentation. Thank you. So thanks, Sam. He always gets the most applause. <laughs> we can all imagine ourselves as programmers if it's just cut and paste, right? <laughs> Makes it look so easy. So we set out this morning. We wanted to uh, have you think about three different things. So let's just do a little review and see how we did. So we wanted to talk about considering new ways of working together to address both standards and interoperability priorities. So we talked about our new steering committee, we talked about InfoCentral and the concept of communities, working groups, and a place for even implementation projects to begin to document and share their work. We talked about exploring the value of engaging with clinicians differently to improve the outcome of interoperability. So we talked about this idea of clinical requirements, both a process and a new tool to publish and build out those requirements. And last week, we talked about identifying new ways to support the actual implementers and developers to achieve their interoperability goals. And Sam just showed you that specification template, a new common way of expressing specifications and how they might look when they're published in InfoCentral. So it seemed like a lot of uh, content to us, but maybe that's because we've been in the weeds developing it. So what we really want to do with our time remaining, although I'm pretty sure we won't use all of our time, is to extend an invitation, as a number of us have done this morning. It's kind of your turn. You can, um, there's lots of opportunities starting now, starting in the next few weeks, to hear more, comment more, and to start to build content with your peers, as we have done before in the past. What's our call to action? Well, we need you to participate and join InfoCentral. We do need some feedback. We need people to volunteer to lead and participate in these new communities and working groups. If you think that this small team of people is actually going to actually make all this content happen, um, we're way too small. So we'll need uh, all of the individuals who have uh, before given so generously of their time and their expertise to continue to do so. 
And we need to identify the right communities and working groups to address real world interoperability problems. There's been a number of conversations today about tying this work back to what you're actually trying to accomplish on the ground. And uh, that's what will make the uh, platform vibrant, make the work relevant. So it's your turn, you can catch up, up with us. We are set up outside to show off some of these tools <coughs> if you wanna see them more closely. Talk to Tanya and Sam. We'll be providing a lot more details in coming months, so you can see on the screen we've got some webinars coming up. Our plan is to uh, do the same demo in a webinar in a few weeks. If you have some folks back at home who you think might like to see all these things, then we'll do a little bit of a double click and do some more webinars just about InfoCentral, about creating a community, how to create a working group. And as you can see, then we'll move into the clinical requirements and specifications things. So this was just a broad overview and we'll just continue to do webinars until we have enough content on the platform that people can see for themselves. <laughs>